sure. Yeah, you got right, the full good. screen there. All right. Well, let's see. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Thomas Hale. I'm the president of FMVA. And tonight we want to talk a little bit about the Northern Virginia Trap Rock Quarries um, and our publication that we just released. And so we have underneath here the geology, mineralogy, industry, and collecting history. And that's really what we're trying to get across in this book and future publications is how can we tie all of these different things together? Um, because in many ways they are all interconnected, but in the past you would have to go read an industry article or go look at a local club's newsletter to get the collecting history or read a, an article from our state survey to get the geology, mineralogy. But in today's world, it's connecting all these things together is really, really important. And so we've tried to do that here. Um, as I always do, I want to give a little presentation overview of what I'm going to be discussing tonight. So the first thing, and in my mind, the most important thing is I want you to meet the publication team because for those that have been following me personally for several years now, the Virginia Mineral Project, you know, before the Friends of Mineralogy Virginia chapter, you're used to it being Thomas, Thomas Hale. But really over the last two years, we've developed a family at FMVA, a team, and that team has worked really, really hard um, over the last two years to create a lot of new things for our state. And so there is an entire group of people behind this publication, and I want you to get to know them because their passion, their energy, and their interests um, really is what made this happen. I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the purpose of the publication. Why are we doing this? What's the kind of historical precedent this is kind of putting forth and some of the new things it's bringing to our community? Uh, book information, just some more of the logistical things, how long is it, et cetera. I want to go over our creative process. Um, what are we trying to cover here? And what are we, what's the point we're trying to get across? Um, this is our first publication, right? Uh, we'll have other ones in the future, but kind of what are we trying to do? And how is that very different than a mineralogical record article or another old publication that you'd see on Virginia minerals? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Nova quarries. Where are they? a little bit about the basic geology and some of the mineralogy, but again, that's not the scope of tonight's presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end, um, but again, just a little brief overview of that. Um, I'll kind of just show you kind of a generalized table of contents, like what are we covering in this book, so a little bit about that. Of course, you're probably all wanting to see some photos, so we'll have some photographs of old photographs from collecting days, as well as mineral specimens, and then the road ahead. Where are we going in the future? Uh, what do we see the future of this publication specifically? Because we don't see it as a one and done. We see it as a, a culminating process, just like the older books from R.V. Dietrich, where we continue to add more stories and more information. Um, any quarry photographs that you see tonight is courtesy of Chuck Stilson, uh, one of the local uh, Luxstone. I think he, he works at Luxstone. And then our mineral photography is by Connor Williams, and, and I'll highlight this on the next slide, but if it wasn't for Connor, uh, we wouldn't be able to get this publication uh, where it is because photographs are really the key thing here, right? There's been so many years of black and white images and being able to put high quality photos in a book is really what brings this to the next level. Um, and so without Connor, we wouldn't be able to have that same impact as we can with this publication. So meet the team. So who are we talking about here? So uh, I was the project director and lead designer, but I'm the least most important person in this whole thing because the other people are really the stars here. Daryl Powell, who's our writer and publisher, he helped put a lot of the pieces together. So if we need to get some more interviews, a lot of the material we had with the Virginia Mineral Project, things that I had collected, but there were some more interviews that needed to be had. There was some more putting pieces together and making it all mesh, and Daryl helped do that for us. Uh, Diamond Dan Publications, which is his publication or his business, helped publish this book. And so we have a really strong partnership uh, with him. Tom Gurton and Andy Dietz or August Dietz are both our publication advisors. Uh, they kind of guided us throughout this entire process and helped keep me on track anyways and the team as well. Again, Connor Williams, a phenomenal photographer. Uh, we are very lucky to get him because I think he's literally just starting his career. And I don't want to say anything about Jeff Scoville, but I'm, I believe Connor is going to be a future talented 
photographer and will maybe one of these days put some some put some competition out there for Jeff. What I think is good because Connor has a lot of talent and at FMBA, we want to support young people who have talent, who want to be in this community. And the more that we can support young people that are starting their careers, the better. And so we're really happy to work with Connor. Um, Alex, our vice president, who you've been hearing tonight, uh, lead editor, getting these things together, which was really important. Alex and I spent some nights working on some of this to get it get it all ready. Uh, Brandy Moore, uh, one of the other editors, and of course, Dr. Alex Spear, who is not just an editor, really, but has also been a core component of FMBA over the last two years. Historical date and safety information, uh, really important here to put this book together. Uh, Andy, John, and Scott Silsby were all collectors. Now, that's not all the collectors that are there. We were working with who we had available, who was willing to work with us right now. And so being able to get those stories are really important. I have Buck Keller here, who, as I'll talk about later, uh, has unfortunately passed away many years ago. But we have his field notes. We have his journals. We've worked with his wife. And so for him to be able to tell his stories after he's passed away and for us to be able to share them with you, that's really what this is all about, right? And we recognize that in the front page here. And, you know, we say that to all of those that have come before us, we're doing that for you. We're wanting to tell the stories of the people, of the collectors, of those memories that may have never been photographed before, put out there into a book. And so we really do it for those people, especially. So we're very happy to share a lot of stories and a lot of information and specimens from Buck, um, even though he's passed away. And then Chuck Stilson at Luxstone and Rob Lanham at Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance for working with us on the industry and aggregate side so that we can get a lot of great information, photographs, and economics and statistics uh, that we've had in this book. On the upper right here, you can see us at the book launch the other day. We had a really successful book launch uh, for those that were there, but also those that were following it. Uh, we were really, really happy to see everyone come out, and we had a great time. Uh, to the left is Daryl, there's Brandy, there's me in the middle, Andy, and then Tom. At the lower right here, you can see us working. Uh, Connor's there doing his thing, Aileen, his girlfriend, and then Andy in the background. And so there was a lot of hours put in this, a lot of passion put into this, but I wouldn't want it any other way, right? It's a team effort, and that's what I think makes it special here is that the more people that have the passion to put into it, that's the better. And that's what we want to try to create here at FMBA. So what was the purpose of this book? Um, well, first, it's been 30 years since you've had a kind of comprehensive mineral publication of Virginia's mineral resources. And this is not a comprehensive mineral publication on all of our state resources. This is the first step. But just like R.V. Dietrich, when he started back in the late 50s, um, he had to start somewhere. And so this is our starting point. Um, but we are, we are doing this because we recognize that since 1990 in the addendum in 1993, there's been a huge deficit uh, in mineral resource information for the public from our state. A lot of that was because our state survey, uh, formerly known as the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, uh, kind of got rid of their public outreach and educational components just through budgeting and staffing issues. And so those 30 years that have passed have really been to a huge detriment to the mineral community because things have changed in 30 years. Technology, social media, YouTube, Zoom, all of these things that allow us to bring all this to people weren't really there back then. And so, as I said, Dietrich wasn't able to record talks and to be able to market the book like we can today. And so it's been such a long time and we really wanted to bring something that was the first step to get people excited again, to get them to realize we have a lot of really cool stuff. And that's been exciting to kind of do that and to show that. Um, again, a lot of this was done in coordination with my older project known as the Virginia Mineral Project. And we chose the Northern Virginia Trap Rock. Some of you may be wondering why. Um, we did it because we recognize that the aggregate industry is essential in today's economy, and it's really essential here in Virginia since we don't have a very strong mineral mining sector here. Um, most of our quarries are just quarries or aggregate materials, very few actual mines, very few mineral mining going on. And so we wanted to highlight something that's relevant, it's modern, there's still a big industry here, and that allows us to connect to something that's real for teachers, uh, which is important for us. We've been very, very happy to partner with the Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance. And so they oversee transportation, construction, right? It's in their name. But anything from uh, 
companies that John John Deere, Caterpillar, all those companies, tire manufacturers, VDOT, uh, the pavement industry, the aggregate industry, you name it, anything that has to deal with infrastructure, they oversee, they're an industry association. And so to be able to tap into that and have that relationship has been really essential for us. Every year, they also give out a free book. And this is one of Dietrich's, not the Minerals of Virginia, but an older one called Geology in Virginia. And that book is over 50 years old. It's in black and white. It shares nothing about the industry today. It tells people nothing about modern eco economics and today's you know, the importance of aggregates. And so we're hopeful, and we're working right now at VTC to take this book and it to be the replacement that's given to about 500 teachers every year. And that would be really, really exciting for us because one of our main goals is to reach the teachers because they're the future, they're teaching the future. And the more that we can do that, that's where we build that new mineral interest is with kids and teachers and people that want to go out and be geologists and mineralogists and get excited. But we also want to do it for the general public and as well the mineral community. Because we recognize, let's be honest, if you're at, at least a tad bit knowledgeable on Virginia mineral deposits and history, you're probably going to want to get this book. If you're just teachers in the general public, it's very specific. And so we wanted to make sure that we accommodate every stakeholder so that way we can bring as many people to the table to talk about this. And as I said, it's not only the first one in 30 years, but it's the first colored publication uh, on our mineral resources. And so that's really exciting for us to share that. As you can see, this is on the back cover of our book, a beautiful still bite. Uh, doesn't look like something you normally see from some of the deposits in Virginia, uh, but it's from the Goose Creek Quarry, one of the Goose Creeks. Um, and it's a beautiful specimen. And we wanted to highlight that on the back of the book because we just thought it's just a, a stellar piece that most people don't really think about when they think about the Northern Virginia trap rocks. Um, but this is just an example. We'll have plenty more that show you the quality of what we're talking about here. So what's the information about the book? So it's a six by nine, 156 total pages right now, fully colored images. Um, we have a complete review of the Northern Virginia trap rock quarries uh, that have produced a lot of these specimens that we're talking about. There's a lot of great maps, information, and resources. We've been very fortunate um, to work with our state survey and work with others to get this information and to make it into the book. Uh, there's a lot of stories here from Buck Keller and others, which is really exciting uh, because some of these finds are some of the famous discoveries from the quarries that have never been told. Uh, and those specimens are on display at the Smithsonian. Uh, so it's really cool to see the story behind some of the specimens for the first time that are now sitting on display when you go to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Um, we have some educational overviews of the geology and mineralogy. We try to be I say in depth, but really it's a brief background for readers. We don't want to go into like a whole geology and mineralogy report because it's out there. Um, we also don't want to keep it too brief, but we want to try to give as much information that makes it relevant and useful for teachers and for those that are interested. Um, and then one thing that's really important that we wanted to get past in this book is specimen identification tips and locality information. Why does an apophyllite from 1967, 1972, and 1994 at the Centerville or Fairfax quarry look different. How can you differentiate between those three different years and those discoveries? And so before it was very hard to do that, you know, and that's what we wanted to cover. So we kind of give you photographs and show you how can you properly identify a specimen um, from 1967, 1972, and 1994. Or what's the difference between a prenite that's found, because prenite's at pretty much all of the trap rock quarries, what's the difference between prenite from Bealton versus Goose Creek versus Fairfax? And there are differences, and we want to highlight those differences. And that adds to what Dietrich never was able to do, because his was mostly, you can find prenite here, here, and here, but you really don't get any information about what it looks like at a, at a depth that allows you to say, okay, maybe that's why it's different here. And, oh, I can actually identify it from this quarry. So how do you get a copy? Books right now are $35. Uh, 400 copies were done for this first print. We're really, really hopeful by the end of the year. I think we're definitely going to have enough interest, it seems, to be doing a second print. If you're an organization or others that have want to do a wholesale rates, they are available. 
just reach out to us. The next public sale that we're going to be having in person to actually give books away in person for sale is the Shenandoah Gym Show in September. And Michael Paps, their president, is here tonight. And I would just highly recommend if you're in Virginia or another club in Virginia or Maryland, please go and check out their show. It's an incredible show. They're going to be doing a lot of great work this year with a lot of great people and tables and vendors. So I can't recommend it enough. Um, so check us out there if you want to get a copy in hand. If you are far away and you may be tuning in from somewhere else and you'd like a copy, um, our publisher, Daryl, will be handling those. So just email me and then I can get you in touch with Daryl and he'll be able to do it in like one or two business days and ship it out to you. So happy to do that. I kind of made this, so it looks a little wonky here, but this is the cover design for the book. So this is what it looks like. I just thought I'd show people. Um, the front cover specimen is in Alex Vinsky's collection. Congratulations, Alex, for making it on the front cover here. Um, it's The photograph is actually by Matt McGill, who's another young mineral collector photographer um, out there with Alex. And uh, this is actually from the Rock Courier's collection. For those that are familiar with Rock Courier, this is one of his specimens. So it's really cool that we can also add some of the mineral community history too behind the cover. Uh, on the back there is that still bite again. And again, we wanted to highlight that this is the first major publication on their mineral resources and deposits in 30 years in that publication form, not just a rocks and minerals or mineralogical record report, but something that is for our community made here um, in a kind of a book format. So what's the creative process behind what we're trying to do here? And why do we make it in the way that we did? So as I said, over 30 years, a lot's changed. And a lot of that change has been fairly negative for our mineral community. Uh, localities have went extinct. Uh, sites have been shut down. Eric and we it was just talking about, you know, there's been this adverse um, perception of mineral collectors. And that's happened in our state. We live in a state where there's not a lot of federal land that you can go collect on. There's no BLM land. And so private land is the majority. And a lot of localities just shut down. When it comes to the trap rock quarries, uh, besides the Manassas quarry, every quarry has shut down to mineral collectors. Uh, they've, they've all completely shut down, closed their doors, and have not allowed people to collect for many years now. And so over 30 years, people have really forgotten about our state's mineral resources, have forgot there's been anything interesting. And we wanted to try to find a way to, to highlight that, but to connect it to other issues that people do care about. And so we wanted to transcend just the collecting community. Like we, we, we know they're going to be interested, but why do we engage other people and outside audiences and industry professionals? And so that's why we put a lot about the aggregate industry here, a lot about the economics and the history and the process of quarrying. We have a whole section dedicated. What's the process of setting up a quarry and how do you go through the process, the blasting, all that different things and to get to the end product. We include that because we want industry to find value in this. We want teachers to find value in this. We actually included uh, three SOL standards in the book, which they're not all the geology standards, but they're three that teachers can use this book to teach. And so we wanted to highlight, hey, if you're a teacher, here are three SOL standards that you can cover by using our book. So we make it very clear to teachers, here's how you can use this to educate students, to educate kids about their minerals and the mining history in their state and why they're important to their still their daily life right now. Um, so I will apologize. This is not a mineral collecting locality publication. This is not a walk five steps to the right, two steps past the oak tree, and there's the dig site. This is not that. This is a step towards a publication that preserves stories, that shares these specimens and images, that shares the geologic history about our state's mineral resources, and tries to pull it all together so that 30 years from now, no one's looking back and saying, well, man, Virginia and Northern Virginia didn't have anything interesting. We don't want to live in that world. We want to live in a world where people know about their state. And so you can go to collect to some of these quarries. We do have a discussion about permissions and safety and all that. But at the same time, it's really about preserving what has been done. And so, as I said previously, it's important for us to tell the difference between the species. So we wanted you to have that. But at the end here, I have collect, preserve, and educate. 
And if you've ever followed me with the Virginia Mineral Project, this is something that I used to say all the time. As mineral collectors, we go out and collect. And that is what a lot of people do. That's what most mineral collectors do. But preserving and educating is not something that every mineral collector does. And that's really the most important part of FMBA. How do we take what's been collected all over these years, the stories, the photographs, the specimens, all of that, how do we preserve it? And how do we use it to educate people? And so we're taking stories of 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and turning them into something that a teacher today can teach students about. So that's really, really exciting for us because it shows that there is something of value in this old minerals community uh, of these stories that we can bring back in today's world. And that's really exciting. So the preservation, the education is essential. And in many cases, you can't collect here, but you can use those collecting stories to do something good today. So where are the Northern Virginia trap rock quarries or the Nova, if you're in Virginia, we'll, we'll say Nova sometimes, so I apologize. Um, not far from Washington DC area, as you can tell from the top. Um, I used to always joke, cause I, I lived in Falls Church, which is Northern Virginia. And I used to always tell people I live near DC and everyone in DC said, you don't live in DC, you live in Nova. Uh, so there's always the Nova community versus the DC community versus the rest of Virginia. But the Northern Virginia trap rocks are really up near the, the nation's capital. Um, and all these quarries are pretty much in the Culpeper Basin, all the quarries that we're talking about specifically in the book. So we have a section where we talk about the geology of the Culpeper Basin. Uh, these are two graphs or charts that you would see in the publication. And it's this Culpeper Basin that is being mined mostly for the diabase. So you can look at the map right here on the right, this pink. I'll talk about what that is on the next page. And so these are where the quarries are being located. Unfortunately, the bigger map has, uh, this is actually a USGS map. And if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to send you the file of this map. And they do have some of the older quarries documented on that map, not all of the ones that we talk about. Uh, some of those are, I think, this was like a 50s or 60s map. But again, this is what we're looking at specifically. And this is where most of that interesting mineralogy is taking place is in this basin, but more specifically in these diabase rocks and that very kind of pink color, that darker pink. So when we're talking about this, if we're looking at it from a MINDAP perspective or a locality pers perspective, we're really kind of emphasizing 12 quarries here. These are the ones that in many ways have produced a bulk of the mineral specimens or have been kind of written about uh, by the mineral community in the past. Um, this is over the last 50 years in Northern Virginia. What's exciting that I always think is that as we develop new infrastructure, as we want to expand infrastructure, there's going to be more quarrying, there's going to be new localities, which opens up the door for new deposits to be discovered and new minerals to be discovered. And that's why we today are trying to work to build relationships with quarries so that if they are discovered, we can preserve them and, and they not get caught up in the crusher. Um, so again, 12 quarries, I'll have a list of those on the next slide. Um, again, trap rock is what we're talking about here. It's hardiness rocks that can be, there's some differences here between basalt, gabbro, diabase, or peridotite. Sometimes they're all considered trap rock or they can be considered trap rock. Don't get too much into that, but this is basic or mafic igneous rocks. They're very, very useful because they are hard igneous rocks for the aggregate sector. So they're mining specifically this diabase mostly here. As you can see, though, on the right, um, you have these diabase intrusions into the rock, the horn fells that are around them, so thermally metamorphosed rock um, that border these other basin sediments that have been infilled as Pangaea was separating. So Pangaea comes together around 250 million years ago. You have rifting that's occurring around 200, Triassic, Jurassic. And as these rift basins open up and sediments coming in, there's a thinner uh, crust and that's allowing these mag magmatic bodies to intrude the local bedrock, thermally metamorphose the rocks around it, and then you get these really cool zeolite minerals that form in these diabase deposits. If you go to Dietrich's book today and you look at how many mineral species have been documented, you'll probably notice there's a discrepancy in this number. It's going to be like 70-something, I'm pretty sure. However, we went through Dietrich's notes. We went through other collectors' catalogs. We went through 
uh, Minda, we went through a lot of different things and we found that through everything combined, there's 87 mineral species that have been documented or reported from these quarries. So that's the list that we try to compile. There may be more, right? That's a common thing. I mean, how much stuff gets thrown away? There's a lot of micro minerals or thumbnail specimens that maybe were never properly collected. Um, and so as we know it today and from the research that we have, there's 87 mineral species that have been documented or reported from the trap rock quarries. To put that into perspective, it's really exciting because we have 430 mineral species documented from Virginia, 430. And while 87 may not seem like a big chunk of that, I personally think it's pretty extensive when you think that just in a very small, you know, rift basin and these diabase deposits, you have 87 different documented mineral species. That's really exciting to see the wealth of the mineral kingdom just within this one area. And so that's another thing we wanted to highlight. And there's a big diversity because a lot of people, when they hear Northern Virginia trap rocks, their brain goes to prenite, apophyllite, stellarite, calcite. But in reality, there's a lot more interesting minerals. Unfortunately, a lot of them we don't even have photographs for still. And so we're trying to work with the mineral community to get more photographs of some of the rare species so that we can actually have a great compilation of what comes out of these quarries. It's also exciting to note, I think we have in Virginia uh, around four uh, type locality minerals in our state, which is where the mineral was first discovered or documented from. Uh, Goose Creekite and Loundonite were both discovered in the Northern Virginia Trap Rock Quarries in Loundon County and the Goose Creek Quarry. Um, both found um, very meticulously because they're very, very small, small minerals, um, very hard to photograph. As Michael Paps knows, they're very hard to photograph. Um, but if it wasn't for someone that was just going through and George Brewer, who was going through and meticulously collecting as a mineral collector and looking at every little small mineral that came through his hands, he would have probably never discovered them. They came off the same boulder. And to think that two type locality of minerals out of the four, that's half from our state, from one quarry because of one collector who took the time. And that really emphasizes, right, the role that we have in adding new knowledge value to the mineral mineralogy community and also preserving uh, state's mineral resources. So it's really exciting to see two of the four from Virginia just in one quarry here. And as things got discovered here way back in the 60s and 70s, um, Northern Virginia material became very, very famous. Uh, specimens flooded the market. I think a lot of people in Tucson, a lot of people out there have specimens from the Northern Virginia trap rocks. It's not uncommon for me as someone who loves Virginia minerals to go out to like the East Coast show or to Tucson or wherever, and you'll probably see at least one dealer with a specimen from Nova. So they're there, they're visible. And you can't say that for many Virginia localities. A lot of the specimens have disappeared over time. Who knows where they went? Maybe they've been thrown away. Maybe they're just in old collections. But a lot of material got out and most of that was just the Apophyllite and Prenite. A lot of the other stuff, good luck. Very, very small, very rare to keep. And a lot of that we just don't have photographs of. Uh, for the geology folks that may be watching this now or later, I just thought we'd include these two charts. On the right here is the same Culpeper Basin, but it kind of gives you a little bit more geology than the other generalized map. Uh, gives you a little bit more about the formations and the specific names of those formations. On the left, our, our, our Culpeper story and the, the regional geology actually goes back to around 1.3 billion, 1.1 billion years ago. And so a lot of that came out. And then the Triassic rifting that we're talking about here specifically for the diabase is again around 220 or 200, 190 million years ago. And that's when you see a lot of the diabase forming. Uh, but the geology goes way back before that with a lot of these critical orogenies that form the mountain belts that we see today. And again, all this is coming as Pangea is separating um, and it still is separating today right now in the mid-ocean mid mid ridge. So why the aggregate industry? Why did we want to do something? I talked a little bit briefly about that, but I thought you may find these interesting. We found these interesting when we were studying this. Um, we know that they're beautiful for, spe I mean, these quarries had great specimens here, but they're really, these quarries are essential to our society. 
one of the most important things that, and one of the reasons I love aggregates is because pretty much all crushed stone, sand, and gravel have to be used within 50 miles of where they're extracted. They're very, their value is very small. It's not like copper or rare earths. And so it makes aggregates a truly local business. We can think of copper, we can think of rare earths, and it goes around all around the world, to all these different manufacturing facilities, processing facilities. And by the time it gets into your technology in your house, you really don't know where it came from. How do you know where all the different elements in your smartphone came from? It's really impossible in the supply chain today to identify all that. And so aggregates though, as a collector here in Virginia, when someone comes to us at a gym show and has a piece of pyrite or has a piece of prenite in their gravel and they say, hey, what's this? Well, it came from one of the trap rocks, not the pyrite, but we the, the prenite. And so we can say to them, hey, this came out of one of your local quarries. And you can't say that about other metal mining operations. And so it's that truly local business that if you're going to try to educate people about minerals and their uses, it, it puts it into a very different perspective. Sure, your smartphone is something you use every day. But these rocks come from your area, and that's really cool. If you account for all of the uses, your automobiles, the transportation, and all that, your house, every Virginian in their lifetime will need about 1.18 million pounds of stone, sand, and gravel. That's pretty impressive. If any of you have ever seen the Mineral Baby from the Mineral Education Coalition, they have all the different metals. But to just think that 1.18 million pounds you'll use in your lifetime and that all has to be sourced locally. And that's pretty incredible. 400 tons of aggregates normally go in your average modern home, 38,000 tons of aggregates in a one mile four lane interstate highway. So when you go up to DC or Northern Virginia and look at all that crazy transportation projects, 95 and all 495 and just all that chaos up there, the amount of aggregates to update the infrastructure and to update the highways and to build them it's a lot of material. And when you compare that to the metals, it just completely overweighs the metals and a lot of that. And so we wanted to tie all this together. So in this book, you'll see a lot more statistics, a lot more information that tries to connect the mineralogy, the geology, and the industry. And that makes it really useful for teachers. When a teacher can take a mineral specimen, can take a rock, can show you that it's local, it comes from your state, and then they have the tools and the resources to educate someone about, hey, this is why it's useful. This is why we need it. And that is way more powerful than taking something from halfway across the ocean and saying, hey, and telling them the same thing. So making it local, keeping it local, it's really useful as a tool to educate. So again, real briefly here before we get into the photographs. Safety and quarry access were essential to us. I mean, we, we wanted to make sure that people understood that safety was primary. If we want to tell the true stories of Nova trap rock collecting back in the days, oh boy, there'd be a lot of, <laughs> a lot of redacted information because back in the days, people actually repelled down the quarries. They did a lot of things they shouldn't have done. They broke into quarries. A lot of those were to preserve specimens, to get specimens out there but a lot of it was unsafe. That eventually led to a lot of quarries shutting down for people and quarry access being completely taken away. And then me in my age, not being able to even get into one of these quarries, never being able to experience this because of the unsafe practices people took years ago. Now you could argue that you may have not been able to get the best specimens if you weren't able to climb into the giant tube of pre and apophyllite. I mean, that's what people did. They climbed in these tubes in the wall to get these specimens. However, I'll never be able to experience that yet because of that. And so we wanted to make sure that safety and quarry access was right there up at the front. How do you collect safely? How can you be safe if you're going to go into a quarry? Because to be honest with you, as we've done this, the quarries seem to be opening up again to FMVA and, and, and wanting to entertain the idea of having access, but doing it the right way. And so we're excited to use the book as a method to try to rebuild relationships. We have a brief geology overview of Virginia, each province that's useful for teachers, uh, overview of the aggregate sector as I was just talking about. Again, exploring the northern trap rock quarries, a little bit about the geology, mineralogy. We have some mineral locality charts and reports. I'll go over those. Uh, collector biographies. Again, we can't put every collector that stepped foot into this quarry. We want to add more stories. We're going to encourage people to give us more information so that we can add to this. Um, 
but we did what we had and what we had with and, and to share those stories with you all. Locality reports, I think that's what a lot of people want to hear about is each specific quarry and the history behind them and the collecting behind that specific quarry. And then we wanted to end it with some supplemental information. So one that we put in this book and we discussed it was maintaining a mineral collection. Because if you're going to pick up this book and you're going to have a fascination with minerals, you really, really, really at an early part of your collecting want to know the proper etiquette and techniques to maintaining the mineral collection. First and foremost, putting labels on your material. And so we thought that if someone was going to read this or a teacher was going to take this information and to tell a student about mineral collecting from this book, we wanted to make sure they knew the basics. So we wanted to include that in here. And because we think that's a really almost essential part of collecting at, an, at the earliest possible you can learn about the proper way to do it. Uh, key terms, there may be words that people may not be familiar with. So we included that. And then some more recommended readings or places that people can go and books that we recommend um, for further information on our state resources or the Northern Virginia uh, Trap Rocks. Uh, this is the specific list of the quarries. So I'll just go through them briefly. You have the Bealton Quarry, the Bull Run Quarry, Cedar Mountain Stone are called Mitchell's Quarry, uh, Centraville Quarry, Chantilly, or Centraville or Fairfax. It's one by different names. We talk about that in the book. Uh, Chantilly, Haymarket, Manassas, the Sanders Quarry. And then I have here in quotes the Loudoun County Quarries, which includes the New Goose Creek, the Old Goose Creek, something sometimes referred to as Virginia Crush Stone, and then the Leesburg Quarry. The reason that we have those in quotes and why they're all bulked together is that there's still research being done to properly get the nomenclature right on some of these quarries because there was a lot of unsafe collecting, a lot of breaking into quarries by certain people in the past. Uh, there wasn't always the proper label on those specimens. And I'm pretty sure at all mineral collectors, we've seen that before. We've seen people not necessarily give the proper location. So for instance, Buck Keller would always put a lot of Loudoun County and he'd leave it to that. Or he would switch names around or wouldn't use the proper name to keep other collectors off his tracks back when quarries were still accessible. And so a lot of that has led to a lot of confusion on Mendat. It's led to a lot of confusion in the mineral community. And people just don't know the right names. If you go to Luxstone today and you ask them and you mention these names that you see here under the Loudoun County quarries, they're not even going to know <laughs> these names because most of these names are the North Pit or the West Pit. They're known by these pits. They're not known by the name. And so all of that matters, the nomenclature matters. It's a lot of confusing, but there are people working on it. And so we just wanted to put that in quotes and keep it that way. Let people know that there's some issues around naming, um, but let the other people who are doing that continue to do that work because it's their own work. So we just wanted to let people know that there's still some issues that are being worked out. And for now, we just call them the Lowndes County Quarries until the other experts come in and reveal that information. Uh, this is the mineral list. I know there's a lot of stuff here. Don't worry, I'm not trying to get you to read everything, but 87, uh, some of these are a little, they're groups or different things like that. Uh, we also had some inspiration from an article. If anyone has ever read it, it's a good one. Minerals of the Washington DC area. And there's another article as well. And we got this idea from this mineral chart that was included in that. And we said, let's take minerals on one side, as you can see here, and then the quarries and try to create a checklist sheet of here's all the mineral species. I think two of them didn't make it in the final chart, um, but take the mineral species, take the localities, and then put X marks here where people can see that as the best knowledge that we have, they've either been documented at these quarries or not. It also allows you to know whether or not a specific mineral species was found in a lot of different quarries. And it also is important because like the Sanders quarry, for instance, there's probably a lot more mineral species there. They've just never been published and verified. And so it shows you how well a quarry has been written up on or how un unwell it's been written up on. It shows you how diverse some of the mineral species are across the quarries. And then for collectors who are going to get this book, we hope that you will go to your collections, look what you have and say, well, wait a minute. No, I actually have an anhydrite from the Bull Run Quarry or something like that. And then you can come back and tell us and we can update that 
at the service to the community. And so this is a great checklist for those that are trying to add specimens from the localities, but also uh, root out discrepancies and root out gaps in our knowledge. And so this is really a useful way of doing that. So we included that because we thought it would be a very useful tool for our community. Uh, for mineral reports, this is kind of, uh, kind of the general uh, look of it. Um, normally for a specific mineral, because we go by minerals, then we go by localities. Uh, on the top, you'll see the name, you'll see the chemical formula. Uh, we normally give the, the kind of origins of the name because we thought that people may find that interesting, teachers may find that interesting, kids that read this. We have a little bit about the mineral history, again, not as expansive, but a brief as much as in, that we deem is important. Um, and then a little bit about the mineralogy of the mineral species as well. Um, we have the properties here, so we try to include that. So if people are going to try to identify specimens or something that at least that information is there, it's valuable, it's very useful for people learning about minerals. And then if there was enough photographs of a specific species, uh, we included a gallery on the right. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of photographs of all the 87 different minerals to date. So we covered as much as we could with the photographs and specimens that we have but we would love to see more minerals be documented and a lot more information. Uh, Loundonite, for instance, one of the type locality minerals that I was speaking about, there's very little information about that out there, like research and stuff. There's like one or couple, just a few articles on it. So there's not much information besides of your personal communication from George Brewer or what's out there. So some of these minerals don't have much information regarding their discovery or what they even look like. Sometimes we don't even know what they look like because we don't even have photographs of those specimens. And that's not a very uncommon thing, unfortunately, across all Virginia mineral deposits. There's a lot of missing gaps in information. We're also very lucky, as I said, this kind of starts our photography session here or the photo gallery to be working with Luxstone and to get a lot of really cool images, uh, drone shots as well. And so this is a beautiful photograph from the Bull Run Quarry. And I love this photograph because I think we're actually going to make a diagram out of this or a little uh, article that we're going to give teachers, kind of an educational tool. But this really shows you all the essential parts of a quarry, the benches, the buffer zone, the processing area, all these different uh, uh, pools and all this stuff. And it shows you pretty much an incomplete bird's eye view, literally, of a quarry and the community that lives around it. And so to see it from this perspective is really cool. And to be able to get these photographs and have permission to use them from Luxone was really exciting um, because you always see a quarry down in the pit, but to see it from this angle, it just, it's really all inspiring to show you where they're digging, where they're kind of transitioning in their process and to see all the different areas of the quarry and how they move material from the blast site to get it sorted to, to setting it up to the final product before it gets shipped off and sold to somebody. Uh, these are some other views from the quarries again. A lot of these are drone shots. Um, and it gets technology, right? It's incredible what we can get out of quarries today and the kind of geology that we can see from a sky view that 50 years ago we may not have been able to do as properly or as detailed as we can today with drone technology. Uh, so again, special sh shout out to Luxstone for allowing us to get these photos and use these photos uh, in the publication for the various quarries that they own. We also have a lot of really cool old photographs. On the left here is Buck Keller when he was really, really young, which is exciting because uh, we, we really don't get um, great photographs of Buck, unfortunately. He was one of those collectors where you really never got a photograph of him, but it was cool to get a photograph of Buck here. Um, this is John Medecci and one of his friends. You can actually, I always like old photographs because you can look at the vehicles in the background and try to guess the age of the photo. Um, these are the tools that they're bringing out. So we thought that was cool to include. Uh, one of the cool things is those long pry bars or these long bars that you see them holding. And what's really cool about that is if you go back to the earliest photograph of a Northern Virginia trap rock collector, Francis Trapp, he's one of the first photographs that we could find. Um, he has a long pole that he was using. So this kind of practice, this uh, knowledge in the mineral community of what's the proper way to dig at a trap rock quarry went back 30 years before this or 20 years before this. 
So it's really cool to see how these practices change and how one photograph can show you some of the collective mineral knowledge of the community. And so that when you go to a quarry, you know how to collect because of the people that have come before you. So here you can see these tools and how they've evolved over the years, just from the learning of, hey, this works and this doesn't work. And I think as collectors, once you get used to a site, you know what works, and then you share that knowledge with other people and they learn and continue to improve and share that knowledge forward. It's like napping and Native Americans with arrowheads, right? You share that collective knowledge. This is one of John's pieces that he got um, painted, which is cool from Susan Robinson. So we added that in the book, just kind of a cool way that you can take minerals, turn them into art, literally. Um, so we thought that would be cool to show. These are some other really cool photographs. Um, a little, little flat of pre-night from back in the days. I was going to show a photograph um, that John had of a toilet. It's literally in this small hotel. Um, they, they went to a hotel. They were collecting one night. And they had pre-night and apophyllite all over the floor in a hotel room, all over the bids in a hotel room. And it was just stacked everywhere. And they were cleaning in the hotel bathroom, which I'm sure if you're a mineral, you, you've done that before. So it was really cool to see some of that uh, in photographs. I didn't include that one here, but these are one of the flats they found back in the 60s. Um, here you can see uh, George Brewer working on a vein of what looks to be probably a puff light in there. Hard to tell from this photograph. And then here's another one of the pieces that uh, I think was in a mineralogical record article by John Medici. And it shows a really cool stalactite or stalagmite of uh, pre night, which is really, really cool. Um, again, old photographs are always really cool to look at. And again, labels are always something special. So kind of for prosperity's sake, you know, here's some of these old labels. Um, you can see how they've changed over the years. So these three on the left side are all uh, Scott Silsby's. So he's just changed over the years. He actually made a specific label for his Northern Virginia Trap Rock collection. This is one of Andy Dietz's labels, Trap Rock Minerals. He made a label for his own collection. Uh, Norman or Tom Martin, he made a specific label just for his Northern Trap Rock. So at a time when people were collecting a lot in these quarries, they actually just made bulk labels for when they found stuff. So that's really cool. Uh, and then down here at the right is a mint green label, and that's one of Buck Keller's labels. So if you ever find that label when you're collecting, it's a Buck Keller collection, even if you can see his name at the bottom. So that's an easy indicator. But this actually shows you right here. Um, he says Vax or the Virginia Crush Stone, and he just says Loudoun County. Um, so this is a datalite specimen from him from one of those quarries. This is really cool. Um, we are also really fortunate to get a colored image of an actual discovery. This is from the 1967 discovery by John, and this is the inside of a pre night tube. So it's really cool to be able to see that up close in color because I'm pretty sure when he published it. It wasn't in color. I'm pretty sure it may, it may, he may have done a presentation where it was in color. Uh, but for the first time, we have a, a colored photograph for our sake of one of the pre night tubes from 1967. Uh, this is really cool. You can see the pre night here, some of the apophyllite coated over it, and these bigger apophyllites. And the 1967 discovery, they were kind of peachy color, skin color apophyllites, very different than the 1972 and the 1994. Um, uh, Thalman site down here, the little pearls that they've kind of cabbed or rounded here for jewelry lapidary. And then I just love that photo of that old Ford there, which is really, really cool. But again, you can't beat modern photography, can you? Um, it's really cool to see photographs of minerals as they are today using modern technology because it really just puts a whole new light on the quality of the minerals that you find in a state. Um, here's this beautiful Scola site, which is really, really cool. Unfortunately, we just have Lowndes County. Buck did not specify. Uh, we have a beautiful still bite here in the center, which is typical of what you would see. Those red still bites that I was talking about earlier are not as common. A sphalerite is also something that was found in several of the uh, Nova Trap Rock quarries. Um, really nice specimens. The largest I've ever seen is about... Um, I, I, I want to say probably two centimeters, but that's probably a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit less than that, but a pretty big one. Otherwise, most of them are just smaller thumbnail pieces. They're perched on top of pre-night, which makes them really aesthetic. 
And so they're collectible just for that reason. So beautiful prenites and, and sphalerite combos. Prenite itself has a broad diversity. I was telling you about the differences here. Um, you see the Bilton quarry here, very lustrous, light colored prenite, um, very, just very, very pretty material. Uh, you also get prenite epidote and other things and some bisolite as well, inclusions. Um, and that's also really cool from some of these localities. And then I don't know why people call it this, but we call them Roman helmets, uh, where you get this really unique uh, mineralization here of the prenite and you get some of that weird morphology exhibits right there in the center down the kind of middle of the ball um, and it creates these Roman helmets as we call it those different habits but again across different quarries and across different time periods the material looks different and that's not uncommon to any other locality in the world but we've really never photographed that in color to show people so this is the first time you actually get to see those differences um, calcite, this is a really cool piece from Centreville. Buck had collected a lot of this material. Uh, really, really beautiful specimens. It's like popcorn almost. Um, some really nice pieces though. I had one a couple slides back where it looked like it was on a stalactite and you had the calcites growing on it. Uh, the stellarite and chavisite, which this is completely natural, no photo changes. There's just incredible contrast from the Manassas quarry. Um, the stellarites, the kind of puff balls or not the puff balls, but the round circular, and then the chabasites, those little smaller ones that you see. Um, again, beautiful specimens from NASA's. That's one of the quarries that still technically allows collecting, but since COVID, they've shut down. Vulcan is the company that runs it, and they haven't really let anyone back in uh, yet. And then another uh, pophylite and prenite. Um, you'll learn in the in the book that Lance Kearns at JMU had done some research and found that the primary apophyte here is hydroxyapophyllite. It's not fluoropophyllite or the others. So you can call your specimen apophyllite if you want to and be general, but if it's tested, most likely it's going to be hydroxyapophyllite. Um, and then again, you get that with the classic prenite uh, underneath the apophyllite. Then there's some weird ones. Um, I, I think the one on the left has to be one of the my favorite specimens ever from uh, the Trap Rock quarries. It was a small pocket, according to Andy and Buck's notes, that they collected. It's calcite coated in hematite. Um, and you get this really nice, you can actually see the morphology or the habit of the calcite underneath. And it's just a phenomenal piece. Uh, I think it's really unique and different for the Trap Rocks. It's not something you normally see. And when I show people this photograph that are used to Northern Virginia specimens, it's something that's really off the wall and is unexpected. So a really, really cool piece. I think Andy has one in his collection. Probably there's some out there on the market somewhere, whether or not they've been mislabeled or lost their provenance, I don't know, but a really nice piece. The Sanders quarry, um, David Fryoff is here tonight. He has collected there a lot, knows a lot about the different minerals there really this quarry is underwritten. Um, there is some discussion about whether or not the pit that these were collected are still active. Uh, there may be a different one that the, the company is mining right now, but at a time, I, I honestly believe they produce some of the best aesthetic specimens from the Northern Virginia trap rock quarries. Uh, it's just some crazy stuff in this calcite here. It's double terminated calcite, just insane. It's a beautiful piece, a smaller piece, but still beautiful. And then these calcite balls, I've seen them on kind of a matrix, but this one was detached. It's really, really cool. It's only two centimeters, but a really, really pretty piece. It's not something you normally see from Centerville or from this area. And then of course your prenites, beautiful prenites, again, I think, and apophyllites. Just the specimen quality is incredible. Unfortunately, as we all know, India has kind of taken over with the zeolite deposits. However, there's still a lot of great stuff and the pieces are still classic and they're very different. I remember going to Tucson and I saw a specimen from Bull Run Quarry and I told the mineral dealer, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say who it was. I told them, I said, this is from Virginia. And they said, there's no way that Virginia has something that nice. And I said, oh, you're wrong. And they said, no, no way, no way. I will call someone and see. And so I said, I bet you that, that it's from Virginia. And they came to me all defeated and they said, yeah, it's from Virginia. We just didn't believe that there'd be something that cool from Virginia. 
it just goes to show you how it can even be lost out in Tucson, but beautiful specimens, very, very distinct from India, another trap rocks up the coast. So a lot of really great specimens here. The one on the right is the 1972 discovery. Um, and so that's one of Scott Silsby's and he has really beautiful handwriting uh, when, he, when he wrote his labels. So lastly, before we have any questions, the road ahead. So where do we go from here? Um, so again, I wanna emphasize that this is just the beginning uh, to what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, we have an ongoing partnership with Diamond Dam Publications. Uh, we have a relationship with Connor Williams, our photographer. We have a team and the team has come together and we're ready to continue. And so we've built a team, we have the team and we're ready to get back in and start doing the next one. Again, this is the first edition. So we do plan on updating and adding more content in the future. So over the next year or two, we highly encourage collectors and other people that are knowledgeable about these trap rocks to contribute. We're not wanting to be the sole source of knowledge on all these trap rock things. That's not our goal. Our goal is to compile knowledge from the community and make it useful for everybody. So if you have information, knowledge, history, even if it's the smallest thing, send us an email, contact us. That's what this is all about, preserving it. And that's what we want to do. We just want to be the source that you know you have a place to go dump that knowledge. And that's what we want to be for the state. Um, our next publication planning phase is actually going to start later this year. Uh, we're eyeing the Piedmont portion of Virginia and its famous pegmatite localities. So Probably we're looking at the next publication include Moorfield, Rutherford, some of the other central Virginia pegmatites. Um, some of these pegmatites have not been written up as much, but we really want to create something that has another theme. So if this is Northern Virginia trap rocks and the educational portion is aggregates, if we do the pegmatites and the central part of Virginia, we're going to talk about critical minerals. That's going to be the kind of educative piece behind our next book. So we don't just talk about minerals, but we talk about something that is useful in today's world. Um, later this fall, we're also going to have our photographer uh, photograph another 100 specimens from various localities. We'll be able to use those for marketing purposes for another mini publication that we'll probably put out. Um, and if anyone's been to shows recently, we have a new Virginia minerals display. And so we're going to get all of those photographed real nice so that we can put them into a presentation or we can share them for marketing research and different things like that. So we're excited for that. Um, and again, community support is essential. Um, getting these books contributes to our future publications. Again, we do it for you. That's the whole point. We're trying to get more people on to FMVA and get in this to realize that we are serious about preserving our state's mineral history and we wanna work with all of you to do that. We want everyone to feel like they can be involved in some way. And that just makes it more well-rounded and makes it more meaningful when the community feels like their collective knowledge is being preserved for future generations. And so that's really what we're doing this for. And so, as I say always, we have our monthly reports that we release. We call them reports, not newsletters. Um, I guess it's it, it, less fear that someone has to write a newsletter if it's called a report. Um, and then our social media, we're very active on YouTube, active on Instagram and Facebook. So you can keep up to date with that. And then on the right here is a photograph of our logo, uh, which is the Barger's Quarry Pyrite on limestone um, from Lexington, Virginia. And we also have a poster that we created. Um, they're for sale as well, limited edition uh, lithographic, sorry, uh, print. And so, again, we're doing new things. We're bringing back all this knowledge and history in a new way. And we're trying to make it useful for teachers, useful for everybody. And, of course, at the end of the day, the mineral community that's always been there, we want you to find value in it, too. So your feedback, uh, insight, input to what we've done is really appreciated. And we hope that uh, you can give us more information. So if you see something, you're like, hey, I got more information on this or, hey, we need to add this or et cetera. That's what we want. We want to create something for everybody. So please reach out to us. Please give us your comments, your feedback, because that's the only way we're going to make it better. And it's the only way we're going to continue to work together to make these publications. So other than that, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. My team is here. They'll be happy to answer them. Um, and I just, this is actually not one of the trap rocks. 
This is the Culpeper quarry that has the preserved dinosaur tracks in Virginia. But I just thought this photograph was a really cool photograph to end a presentation on. Um, but thank you, everyone. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have.